So, are you seeing my deck? Yes, we can. Great. So, um, good afternoon. I am Anto Budiagio. Welcome to Monday Live. This is something that we do every Monday at 3 o'clock. Um, so, uh, we're all listed on mondaylive.org. Uh, just a reminder, this is the most important part, is that views expressed here are personal, not of any company or organization. I think you all know how to use the tool, the Zoom tools by now. Just a reminder, this deck is um, available on mondaylive.org if you want to refer to it um, after, during or after the, the show. Um, our focus for the month of June is smart building enablers, trying to figure out what they are. Uh, and our agenda today is we'll have our normal chit chat on, on news and trends, uh, and then we'll get into smart grid, uh, not smart building enablers, and focused on smart building user experience. And we have a, a, a guest uh, that will uh, join us for that. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but before that, some slides that we've put up um, to for, on, on news and trends. Start with Ken. Over to you, Ken. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, we've still got our Pushing the Digital Dinosaurs online and we had uh, uh, Bill come back to me with uh, uh, calling me an anti-dinosaur, anti which I appreciate, and gave us the Kodak moment, which uh, reminded us uh, what happened to Kodak uh, when they were kind of too big to change and uh, the whole business went down. Uh, probably a pretty good example of what I'm kind of re referring a little bit to. Uh, inside of that, uh, I had a little more, little more chit chat and talked about, uh, you know, just how our, our technology kind of is the filter that we look at our world with. And uh, it kind of makes us start thinking, are we sort of trying to explain our present position in black and white when uh, uh, the industry is moving in digital vivid color? Uh, I think we have to get more into that IoT uh, lingo and basically present ourselves in that direction. Uh, next thing that's happening to us is we're evolving our July theme, which is navigating the next new. And uh, how do we quickly understand, procure, and make the next new part of today's smart buildings? Uh, I banter a little bit about uh, my history. Uh, in direct digital. Uh, and we had sort of the same situation when it hit is it was, it was uh, pretty hard to put in a box that uh, everybody was going in a different direction. Everybody had a different uh, thought of what this might be. And uh, so we chose to use a vehicle called the request for proposal. And we basically uh, uh, had them uh, give us what they thought we, we basically tried to identify our mandatory requirements. Uh, and that's an interesting process is to shake your head and completely separate yourself from the technology and try and decide in a group what it is you're trying to do and what are your mandatory requirements and your reason for procurement. And then once you do that, then you can start uh, interviewing uh, folks that you would like to give, have you give uh, you proposals. And this whole process was, uh, was very, uh, very enlightening, I think. Uh, the approach requires the complete buy-in and the total support of the owner of the project who needs an appetite to share and understand the risk and excitement of implementing deep, innovative creation, uh, creating which has not ever been done before. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of, a, I think, where we're at. And I think even if you can't convince your client to buy into the request for proposal approach, I think that it's a good exercise to go through for each of our companies is to, uh, to basically go out and a request for proposal to how do we present ourselves. And I'm looking very forward to, uh, very much forward to Paul's comments. Uh, I haven't heard him speak, but I have heard uh, uh, his partner uh, speak at the Trollcon, uh, Don, Donnie. And uh, I, I was very intrigued by how they had actually changed uh, somewhat the direction of their large consulting firm and brought in a new division <coughs> that basically deals with uh, uh, the interface. So I very much believe that the best way for our industry to move forward with AI first and mobile first thinking is to, is to basically use this request for proposal approach 
because we both right. have to learn a whole lot about what's happening. And in addition to that, then we have to understand how we might procure that and package it. Uh, for Great. Discussion. And I also, just in leaving, I, I don't like the term artificial intelligence. And I would like to kind of start thinking more about that as additional intelligence. Uh, the last thing we need in our industry is more things that are artificial. Back Good point. You. Good point. Thank you, Ken. Sort of moving on to John. Yeah, hi. You know, I've, I've posted some things about this. Um, I, I think this is a really important trend. Uh, I'll suggest people who are, you know, um, in the industry to help people with energy efficiency and achieving sustainability follow what I think is a really developing um, attitude, a backlash against the mis uh, application of the term net zero and how many corporations are greenwashing using it and how it alone isn't um, going to be adequate to achieve sustainability goals. It, it's not simple because on one hand you'd say, well, net zero is good and it is, but they identify there's a growing um, communication in the industry around how many things it misses and how it really doesn't focus on um, you know, reducing the carbon that's being in introduced to the environment. I think there's something here that, uh, you know, how we, I think a lot of us saw how COVID had unexpected impacts in business and business decisions. You know, they say, what, there's nothing so powerful as an idea as time has come. I think there's something going on here around uh, this reassessment of net zero and what it means. So I'd encourage people to look at this article. Great, thank you. And Mark, some bits and bites and pieces. Yeah, I, so I kind of did something a little different this week. Uh, instead of sharing an article or two that kind of caught my attention and I kind of looked at various things. So what I've got for everybody today is, as the title says, bits, bites, and pieces. And interesting facts or tidbits I see out there. Uh, by 2025, it's predicted that 56 billion connected IoT devices will be scattered across the planet keyword planet, uh, with edge generating more than 75% of all the enterprise data. That's kind of, uh, you know, kind of eye opening for me. And next one, 4 million buildings in the US alone rely on rooftop units for building comfort and uh, healthy environments are all the stuff that we all do. Uh, it's estimated that half of these don't have regular HVA service or building automation system or connected to a building automation system or some kind of system. And then, you know, we're all looking at uh, going back to work and some of us were already there or whatever. Three interesting things that jumped out at me from a company called Scoop Technologies. And they are a ride share organization. However, like COVID, they're sort of looking at reinventing themselves. In their latest survey, 58% of the employees reported that they're extremely or somewhat comfortable in returning. 71% indicated that vaccines should be required or strongly encouraged. And I think we all have seen that seems to be a lot of chatter now in the news, whether or not someone is vaccinated or not to go anywhere. And then 62% uh, roughly uh, want the hybrid model and basically most people saying they'd like to return to the office just two to three days a week. So just stuff to keep, uh, you know, always keep our tabs on. So that's it. Mm. Great. Thank you. Uh, and next is me. I came across this uh, venture beat article about little twins, um, and, uh, the construction industry, um, labeling it as a key enabler so other than that aha, that's kind of this this month's topic um, there's actually quite a number of digital twin consortium people um, quoted in this in this uh, piece uh, so uh, you may find it um, interesting um, but you know again the the, the 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 continuing sort of drumbeat of uh, digital twin um, in the uh, smart building space sort of continues that's uh, really my my purpose of highlighting this um, and that is that as far as the slides. So um, I'm going to, while I bring on um, Paul, um, Steve, hey, can, you, can I 
Can I add something real quick? Please, okay. go ahead. Go Just ahead. super quick. I didn't get it into the, uh, the slides, but I want to make a recommendation for a book. Um, okay. It's, a, it's a, a book that matches really nicely with what Ken's talking about and what we talk about often, which is the underpinning of everything. And that is, the, the book itself is called Anthrovision. It's an anthropological approach to solving business problems. And it goes into tribes and tribalism and, and culture and all that and how all of that gets in the way or contemplates how things get created and problems solved and all this. So it's a, it's a, it's a new book out of the UK, PhD out of the UK. And I highly recommend it for anybody who's looking for ways to sell, solve uh, anything else and what we talk about. So look for it. It's by Jillian Tett, T-E-T-T. -T. It's called Anthrovision. Why don't you put a, a link to the, uh, to that book um, in, in the chat? so that Will everybody do. can see it. That'd be great. Will do. So I've brought uh, Paul uh, on as a panelist. Um, Steve, can I Please. hand over to you? Yeah, so um, Paul, uh, we appreciate you joining our session today. Uh, for those of you who don't know Paul Maximuk from uh, Newcomb and Boyd, uh, he comes to them fairly recently, as I understand it, and uh, with, a, with, with a long time that he spent at Ford Motor Company. And uh, this, this week, our session is all about uh, usability as an enabler, uh, as what's going to make buildings smarter. We're trying to really look at what are the obstacles, if you will, to making buildings smarter. And one of the ones we've identified is usability. We think uh, the, particularly the younger generation coming up uh, who's used to being able to do everything from their phone and wanting information uh, uh, by simply Googling for it, uh, have are going to be placing similar expectations on us as an industry to provide them with relevant information in a, in a manner that mimics what they're used to doing and so we felt it would be great to have um, paul in particular because of his end user background really speak to this subject so paul i think maybe it'd be good when you start out is just do a little bit more telling us about your background and why uh, you've joined Newcomb and Boyd in this context, because I think it's, it all very much is relevant to our, our discussion here today. Well, thank you, Steve, for the intro. Um, hi, everybody. Paul Maxima, uh, Newcomb and Boyd. I actually been at Newcomb and Boyd almost 16 months. Okay. I started like just before COVID shut down. Um, very interesting, went down, onboarded, and then came back in, to Michigan and two weeks later, Everything was shut down. So I'm based out of Detroit, Michigan. Our headquarters is in Atlanta. Um, as you said, Steve, previously, I worked at Ford Motor Company. Prior to that, I had 30 plus years in the field. So I've been engaged with mechanical systems, <laughs> lighting control systems. I've worked with both service and install of these systems. I've also been engaged with some of the smart technology at, as it started to roll out several, probably about four or five years ago when it was first coming out at Ford Motor Company um, with the uh, vendors coming in. So I, I know some of you already, great to see you again. Um, what I really would like to talk about and listen to what you uh, would like me to answer question wise is how do we get started with this process? You know, the user experience is a huge thing to tackle. And I can just, let's start with who needs to be involved with user experience and deciding what those things are. And I think one of the key things that we see all the time in our organization when we're working with clients is not all the right people are at the table. Typically, it's a group designated for user experience to solve some of the use cases that they've developed, but they don't engage the IT folks, which is a huge concern because you're connecting to those systems. Um, you're bringing data from multiple sources that may already be on a corporate network, may possibly be a cloud hosted solution, could be something that may be a hybrid of both, and quite honestly, um, it's too late in the game to bring the IT team to there after the fact. So one of the key things 
that I would recommend anytime you go on this journey, when you're developing your use cases, when you're working for your user experience, how you want to present that and connect all these different systems is bring that engagement. Make sure you have solution architects, cybersecurity experts, uh, your network engineering teams involved as part of that day one discussion, because they are really going to be able to point you in the right direction, especially if you're doing this as an enterprise solution, as many of you may have been involved with, um, with global uh, deployments. So that's a first step. So one of the things that we uh, start when, you know, Donnie, as, as Ken mentioned, Donnie uh, Walker was out at ControlsCon. And we talk about that smart uh, building, uh, building out that infrastructure, building out that user experience, you know, working with the use cases and what you're trying to achieve. The bottom line is we're looking at a lot of different types of information. We have a lot of different groups have different requirements and really we need to define those and see how we can merge those things together and use those technologies that are already on-prem connected to your systems, such as your BMS, you know, your elevator, you know, your fire protection, all those core infrastructure systems, and then start bringing in other systems that may include occupant experience, such as your spatial utilization sensors, people counting, contactless uh, security entry into the facility, elevator calls, turnstiles, where it starts to become a seamless um, experience to that user. And that's really what we try to drive to. We don't want people to have to think about how to use the technology. We want the people to use that technology as an enabler to solve their day-to-day -day, um, you know, issues that you may have in you know, trying to get around, connect to meetings and so forth. So. I guess let's start there and I guess let's start looking at answering maybe some of the questions that you may have or somebody may have, and then I can go in deeper as you ask me those questions. Well, uh, I'm gonna start actually, Paul. So knowing that okay. these systems are so siloed and coming from different vendors in most cases uh, mm -hmm. with, with unique user interfaces, um, how do you overcome, assuming that it's all, you've solved the problem of, of accessibility by bringing in the IT team from a network mm -hmm. perspective. So it's not a question of getting to the data, but now the way the data is being uh, presented is gonna be unique, unique to each of those vendors. What, right. What's your thoughts about creating some sort of a common way of accessing data and visualizing it? Because it seems to me that's still largely missing in our industry today. Absolutely. Everybody has their own solution, right? They, they say, buy my pack, you know, my whole solution that covers everything. Well, it doesn't. So one of the key things that when you're going down this journey is you need to start thinking about your de design guidelines and specifications and how you're going to identify common protocols that you're going to use across the enterprise, um, common network, uh, communication um, connections, if it's going to be IP based, if it's going to be a wireless solution or a Wi-Fi connect connectivity solution, those things all need to be identified, right? Mm -hmm. And when we start to look at this and we work on this journey, it, it's also how you layer those software stacks together. If you have a gateway device, that you're aggregating sensor data, let's use as an example. Mm -hmm. That data can't, you know, it, it's a MQTT transport. It's pretty straightforward going up to somebody's cloud. We're starting to see a lot of hardware that is starting to be able to route that internally because you understand what the data is actually telling you and you can display that on an on-prem solution or a high hybrid cloud type of solution. You get, have the best, post of Beth, Beth oh, excuse me, Best worlds, my dog's parking in the background, apologize. Um, so we, we start to look at that. I think a lot of it's gonna be on the owner. Where do they want their data to be at? Do they want it on-prem? Do they want it in the cloud? Are they good with connecting these other systems to a cloud, you know, that can expose them, you know, with a cyber risk, or do they wanna contain it all internally? And with that, 
if it's all internally, you know, it's a matter of bringing that data and creating that visualization dashboard on-prem. And there are a lot of solutions that will work and be able to build that out. It's basically how well the MSI can bring those things together. Actually, uh, uh, Dan, uh, Donnie talked a bit about the, the explosion of mobile uh, in the building and, and the importance of that. And just what that was starting to be a big part of what you guys were doing uh, because some of the owners wanted or where I had needed that. I, guess, I think it's starting at the uh, access to the building. Uh, right. Part. And then once it's there, then it rolls into location services and, mm -hmm. and so forth. I was kind of intrigued by that piece because everybody on this screen tends to focus with the HVAC lighting uh, mm -hmm. or traditional type, the, the hard the hard bits of the building. Uh, but there's this new floating soft bit <laughs> that is falling on us. Can you maybe speak a little bit more to that? So the mobile app development, right? Everybody wants a mobile app, especially the newer workforce coming in to the market segment. Everybody's used to using their phone now. We're, you know, we see such a different variant from people starting right out of college to where people are at, maybe they've been at, at the workplace for 10 years plus. And then you get to people, you know, the range where you start to see people getting close to retirement, they may not care as much about those features and functionality. But I, I guess my question would be, when you look at designing that mobile experience app, that integrates your solution, not only to your work, but it also gives you the opportunity to connect that with your home life as well. And you look at most of the people, myself included, I have a connected home. You know, I am connecting, I'm adjusting my temperature remotely. So when I get home from work, when I was traveling or going to the, you know, from the office home, I want to make sure it was comfortable when I got home. I could turn lights on. I could enable things to happen. People want that connectivity. And using that mobile app, you start to connect either through API integrations or software connectors where it enables the functionality of different platforms into your handheld device. And it could be a tablet, but most people, you know, they're either it's an iOS uh, Apple system or it's Android system. You know, those are the two uh, main players that everybody integrates to. And everything you do nowadays is impacted. We do banking through our mobile device. We execute retirement changes or HR changes through, I have an app for everything. And it's interesting that um, the adaptation of that seemed to be slow in the very beginning, but what we're seeing now in the marketplace is everybody's starting to want that. And it covers not only employees, but when you get into commercial property, commercial real estate, they want tenant experience apps too, because it's a two-way street. It gives connectivity to the building for contactless entry, information, maybe environmental air quality data in the building. If you, know, you can stream uh, health issues, if there's a concern, you know, like a flu epidemic or, you know, when, when COVID hit, obviously that was a major eye opener. And then you can also stream content about what's going on in the building, whether it's the meals they're serving in the cafeteria, whether it's announcements of things that they're going to do. It's a broad band mobile capability. And it's like Facebook or anybody else where it streams to it's multimedia to multiple people. The easiest way to reach people. So Paul, are you seeing specific vendors entering the space uh, offering that kind of mobile functionality? Yes. And we, we see multiple vendors doing snippets. We okay. see vendors that are focusing on the core infrastructure of the building. To me, that's, that's useless. Right. And you can do that, you know, if you're going to do that, just access through a web browser, right? If, if right. you need that capability. But where the key is, is having that connectivity where you can interface with your Microsoft, let's say 365 uh, conference room bookings, meeting scheduling, looking for people, a coworker in a facility. This is one of the use cases we are deploying right now where you want to connect with them to have some collaborative time in a specific office area, you can search 
your locations, book something, meet those people, find out where they're at through location-based services, mm -hmm. which is all systems you already have in a building anyway. Most of the lighting control stuff, if you have it in there, it has Bluetooth beaconing functionality. So they pick up the beaconing and they use trajectory off your mobile device through the Bluetooth and they know exactly where that person is, your person is. You don't need breadcrumbs to get all the way to it. You can see where you're at and where you need to go, similar to like Google Maps. Mm -hmm. That's how you're bringing that indoors now. So Paul, it's, it's Mark. So let me ask you this. So from your transition from Ford, Ford Land over to uh, Newcomb and Boyd, mm -hmm. what have you seen that has changed with building owners uh, between the uh, regarding OT and IT strategic plans to encompass the, you know, smart building technology, I guess, just to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. What have you seen? Is, is there anything different from when you were at Ford Land? Uh, the fact that you've had the, the opportunity to talk to different types of owners and operators, different types of buildings mm -hmm. that they're building and so forth and so on. How about a little perspective on that? Okay, absolutely. So let's, let's talk enterprise folks. You know, your big players similar to like Ford. Obviously, they're going to want it on their own network and manage and control the security whether it's a mobile connected device, whether it's a hardware connected device, whether it's the software, they manage and control the security and information security policies on there. When we get into other spaces like commercial office space that maybe there's a building owner and then there are tenants that are not part of that corporate network, we're seeing that since things occurred in 2020, this went from not that critical to extremely critical now to be able to spin up some type of network that can have the connectivity to both the tenants and the people that are managing the facility and offering these type of amenities and uh, a tenant experience app for their mobile device. You know, it's, it's changed quickly. I think, I honestly think if COVID hadn't hit, this probably wouldn't, we wouldn't be talking about this right now because I don't think people had the priority there at that point in time. It still had been the core infrastructure in the building. They started to venture out about a little ways, but it, it was still early on. This just escalated and moved things forward quickly. And that, well, that even, well, even IAQ, right? You know, bringing IAQ sensors into the frame. Well, so, uh, just one, one second, one second, Ken. I, I actually have to take my leave because I have to catch a plane. I'm gonna leave uh, all of this in the, the in the hands of uh, in john's capable hands uh, sorry paul i'm not able to uh, be part of the rest of this but this is very fascinating and i'll be watching the the video thanks guys thank you Erico. nice yeah. meeting you take care Likewise. yes paul so what i wanted to ask is uh, i think we have a situation that uh, the msi is drowning in functional creep uh, so many <laughs> things are falling on him uh, and I think Donnie talked a bit about this, which uh, I found extremely interesting, is that he saw that this was, again, came back as a task falling on the, uh, the, the consultant. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, we've, had a, we've had a situation we've gone through where the consultants have run kicking, screaming, and crying and gone away from all of this. So I was quite impressed that you guys had actually created a team to, to address this. Uh, right. Can you maybe just banter a little bit about where a master systems integrator might stop and a user experience? Uh, how How is that going to get trolled into the buildings? Can you maybe just chat a little bit about that? Sure, absolutely. So let's let's talk about the MSI portion first. That's a very loose generic term. <laughs> um, I typically think there's controls contractors and your core system infrastructure contractors that configure the DDC controls and make sure the mechanical cooling works, the lighting company comes in, the lighting controls are set up and they function, the elevator, the security system, they're all standalone system silo, right? So you come in with a system integrator. System integrator to me and to the perspective we have is that a system integrator 
will start to connect those core infrastructure building systems into a centralized platform where you can start to integrate energy data, you can start to see what's going on with the security systems, maybe do a couple things that uh, will use that, utilize the data from generated from those systems. And MSI, now that brings you to a different layer. That becomes almost a system integrator combination with a software development um, team as well. And they're starting to do all the connectors connecting to APIs, you know, where they can bring and stream data and manage that data flow from, you know, from a device up to a cloud connection or an internal software source. They can integrate multiple software platforms. So they may bring in the work order management system. They may bring in some financial systems to start sending data back and forth that's aggregated from there. In addition to that, typically some MSIs get involved with the design and architecture. But what we found is that seems to be the weakest link, right? They're, they can go and connect an API, they can connect to the data, but building all the bridges to get from point A to point B, it doesn't work out too well. So what we found is our team sort of acts in somewhat of as an MSI to bring in the connectivity to stream the data, to understand what the data requirements are, understand the standards for tagging the data, how that's gonna be done, understanding how the software solutions will connect, the network connectivity is built out. We do a lot of those designs. We, we do the breakdowns of the different divisional specs and how those will all connect. We do the infrastructure drawing so we know that we have the capacity through the fiber network and the network uh, gear to make sure that we can bring all these data in and segment these networks so that you can route the data where it needs to go in a secure fashion. And then also be able to make sure that we're not gonna bog down the network where you, you shut everything down and it locks things down. So that's sort of where we start to play into the picture. And then we get involved more forward facing with the client or the building owner or the developer, whoever's the one that's uh, wanting these use cases delivered, we will get involved with them and start to build what their requirements are around that user experience app and bringing that mobile connectivity in there. Because that takes a lot of backend work to bring all those requirements together. Because if you don't have greatly defined use cases, you're never gonna be able to deliver it. It's just not gonna be successful. So we try to, you know, everybody wants all these things. We try to focus on streamlining these down to some key critical deliverables for day one. And once that's defined and we're able to bring the design so that we can implement and deliver those to the end user. And then maybe day two, some of the additional use cases that were discussed can be deployed at a later time. That's what's nice about the way this mobility uh, fits together with the mobile devices and software design, it's scalable. We can start day one and then expand those use cases to day two and beyond. And your company bills themselves as a mechanical consultant? The core business was mechanical, electrical and plumbing. And then Donnie brought the team, you know, he started the team and started to bring that, that smart technology. And what we haven't even talked about is like the audio, video, visual uh, component, the digital signage. This is all part of the interactive groups that we work with. The security team, you know, it, we may be siloed internally slightly, but when we bring the projects together and start working and building this out you know, from the use cases and the design side, all these teams work interactively. We're very collaborative. You know, we have multiple hooks into everything. It depends on where the owner wants to take his vision at. And what, what is the, your, your team, what is the actual title of your team? Or when you're, when you're building it on your proposal, uh, what, what does it classify this service? Because this is somewhat an extra service that I would right. expect from the mechanical. So our group is the Intelligent Buildings Group um, for Responsive Buildings. So, oh, so well, I have a question. Picking up on that, um, I'm just, you know, 
the building owners have a traditional idea how much the consult the MEP consulting should run from a cost perspective. Mm -hmm. and, and now you're you're adding a whole nother area of expertise, which yes. is absolutely needed. Yes. Is there a willingness to pay for it? Some clients want to pay for it, some don't. Right. Yeah, sure. Some what what we typically find it it all ends up what's the return on investment, right? Hmm. If what they're starting to see with our group is the value of having us involved from day one, be, you know, with the architects and that development team before it goes out to the final bid where they have all the prices um, put together for the project to kick off to the GC. Because what happens is a lot of times there's a lot of redundancy and that's where we can start to see if we do things, instead of doing it the traditional way, we start to move it so we can switch some things and pivot it with a different thought process. Mm -hmm. We start to bring all these systems together at a lower cost. Maybe we don't need 20 different software platforms. Maybe we only need two or three software platforms mm -hmm. to make it uh, visualize that data in a single pane of glass, right? Right. Paul? Hey, Paul. This is, sorry. Hey, Paul. This is Gina. Hi, Gina. So, Hi, Gina. Hi. So let me ask you. So after you've done your specification and the the, who is responsible for the commissioning as built to ensure that the project adheres to your specification and your requirements? So one of the things we found is <laughs> with the smart technology, there are too many people that do that. Mm -hmm. So we have put, you know, our commissioning team has the skill set to do um the smart billing commissioning and integrating all these different systems. We're currently doing that on a, a highly visible project in Atlanta right now. So we've gone through the design, the commissioning agent that's there will vet out all the core mechanical electrical systems and get that wrapped up. And then the handoff occurs with the smart technology to our team. And basically that scope is validating things are installed as the design intended, validating the functionalities there, validating data sets, making sure if it's a contactless entry, making sure that things work properly, make sure that you know, the security that was specified in the requirements is a, you know, deployed there, especially in some cases where if it's not an enterprise solution, if it's going to be at a owner spun up network, we want to make sure that they follow that security policy that they work with, with the IT team that they have contracted. So we, we get involved. There's a lot of handshakes, right? It, it's not just one core little group. We connect to all those different vendors, sometimes very challenging. How and big a lot is of your times, team? what's that? How big is your team? Um, oh God, I think we're like 10, 10 or 11 now and expanding. So we have a IT uh, networking cybersecurity specialist um, on our team based out of Detroit. Um, we've, Michael and I have worked together on putting some core documentation together to deliver a Division 25 specification. We see that a lot where that's requested to incorporate that into the bid documentation for the RFP. So we have some core uh, standards that are part of that. Um, we also um, have our different specialties. I have uh, someone on our team that's specialized in the app development that works with the app developers to make sure the deliverables are there. And then obviously we have sustainability. We've done net zero projects. That's obviously a huge issue as well. Um, making sure that you have the blended team to cover all the requirements because energy and sustainability is a huge issue as well. And then the well building aspect too, we have a team for that as well that we integrate with. So hey, if you want to throw a question, whoops, sorry, from the audience here, uh, because you're talking about specifications and bidding and stuff. Are you using Division 25? How does it fit in with the... Uh, you know, with the specification structure at all for the stuff you're doing, because you're talking about crossing a lot of boundaries here, right? Yeah, absolutely. So we get involved with all divisional specifications. We build out the specifications. There's generic specifications, obviously, that are pretty standard in the industry. And then we customize and tailor those to the individual client's needs. So like the division 25 can be a very simple document or can become 
quite complex because of the number of systems that are going to be integrated. Is when you put that together, you have to cover all those systems in there, and you have to make sure that the reference is also on the back end divisional specs as well. For example, if it's a division 23 or 26 or 27 spec, those all have to be incorporated and cross-referenced in divisional 25 specs. Roger, you had a question. Yeah, Paul, oh, sorry, Roger, Roger, I have a question for you really. And um, most of the people on the call, one of their challenges is, is you know, who is the customer these days? You know, it's changing a lot between you know, the occupier, the owner, maybe the FM company, because a lot of the things you're talking about are mm -hmm. kind of aftermarket services, you know, whether it's paid, because retrofit refurbishment may be 75% of the market, right? Right. Are you seeing the customer, whoever that may be, becoming more intelligent? Because the challenge for most of the people here are, how do you get access to that person? You know, who, who do you go to in Ford or PwC or whoever else you're looking for is a real challenge for everybody here. Mm -hmm. And that is a dynamic that's going on at the moment between the occupier, the, the you know, the, the owner and, and FM companies. Right. And everybody has a shiny object. Sales guys are great at getting in the door to talk to either a facility management firm that maybe manages the building. They get in front of the developer. There's a lot of relationships out there, right? Typically what, we, we get engaged with is not only an owner, it, you know, it depends on if an owner like downtown Atlanta, you know, there are some owners down there that are building out new buildings. So there's new construction. And then once that's been delivered, they've gone back and looked at that portfolio and said, you know what, we want to do this same thing in other locations. And I'm working with a client now for over a year that uh, we went down the smart technology uh, roadmap where we developed um, their smart uh, technology master plan and started to bring that integrations into some of their new builds and retrofit and some of their existing infrastructure. Um, we're highly involved with developers. A lot of times the developers are starting to see higher visibility. You cannot get away from technology and not read about something somewhere. Right. Somebody's published a white paper. Somebody has published uh, some cool things that people want to have, you know, whether it's a new mobile app, whether it's a new sensor technology that's going to save them money, whether it's a condition risk based maintenance uh, widget that's going to help you identify when you need to do your maintenance so you can save on the cost of constantly scheduling things. There's a lot of different use cases. But I think where we get involved with, sometimes we've had people reach out to us directly. Sometimes we've pursued projects where maybe uh, our team wasn't engaged originally, but the mechanical team, electrical team have been engaged with the client. And they say, you know, we have a team that also specializes in some of these other items. And then they bring us to the table that way as well. And I mean, it's some of it's just good old fashioned uh, business development. And, you know, being out there and talking about things and you talk to 10 people, one person may think that it makes a lot of sense and that's what we want to do. And how do we start to go and do this? Do you find that you're unique in this or are, are now the other major consultants starting to uh, realize the necessity? I think what, what we're, we're really discussing is that this whole automation user experience has has become part of the design fabric uh, and is important as mechanical, electrical. Uh, and, and I think that's where we're heading with this. It, it, does everybody see that or are you kind of unique? You, you feel you're kind of unique in this field? Everybody is starting to see that. You know, definitely because a lot of times internally through the property management firms, they you know, they may be involved and they start bringing some technology or they have groups that work in that type of technology and want to get that in front of their building owner. I would definitely say um, it has really escalated within the past 15 months. We see almost every RFP that we get engaged with, we see some component of smart technology in there, whether it's uh, 
app development for user experience app for tenant experience interface or employee experience interface. Um, a lot to do IAQ, well building. I'm telling you, I, I think almost everybody now is starting to seriously look at that because of the concerns generated with you know ventilation. We went to being totally energy efficient and shutting things down through example, demand ventilation where if there's nobody in that space or, you know, it's unoccupied, why are we ventilating? Well, now it presents problems where you don't have enough ventilation in the facility and you start to have issues, you know, with CO2 levels getting too high or you start to have air quality issues where the air quality may not be great enough because you're not ventilating enough anymore. And that's a huge concern. You read a lot of different things about the COVID virus and how it transmits and and having it sit there within your infrastructure, one of the key things that Ashray said is ventilation, increase your ventilation. And everybody started to go out there and do that uh, initially and changing their filtration, right? So definitely um, interesting. I think we are not the only player in town. We, we have expanded, our group, our team has grown. Uh, it's continually growing. We're seeing new individuals that I think we're starting to expand that internally where we can all be part of one team and maybe share some of that collaboration expertise to build out a project where maybe we need one guy that's a security expert for 40 hours worth of work, right? To put those pieces together. And then the rest of the team, it's as needed and bring, but it, it's all collaborative in there on all the technology side. Mechanical, I have even... Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I, I even re reached out internally to our groups and said, look, we're doing mechanical systems. We're, we're specifying controls, but we're not engaged with there. We could help you work with that client and help them understand putting the same thing in may not be the right answer next time around when you're doing uh, renovations, retrofits, or new builds. Start looking at where the technology is going to lead you and what you want to do with the data. So, sorry. Oh, hey, hey, um, go, ahead, go ahead, John. Go ahead, John. Go. Um, I had a question for you. I'm assuming that um, since you're doing Division 25, that you're also that you're. Um, but just to clarify, that you're writing performance-based specifications and not prescriptive. Yes. Okay. You answer that. <laughs> and you, that you have no specific basis of design. We typically generate a basis of design, but we okay. also generate performance criteria. Okay. Um, and last question, and are you seeing a specific size of building or type of building, meaning it's building use as um, more um, accepted, uh, accepting of this type of new design or design? Typically, the majority of the buildings we're working with are over 350,000 square feet. However, okay. we have done smaller deployments, like around 100 to 150,000 square foot uh, facilities that are starting to look where they're multi-integrated. Multi Maybe there's a small manufacturing component of it. Um, where we're looking at some of the technology on that side and then bring it in the office environment, maybe a small data center as well. Okay, the question I wanted to ask is you mentioned uh, the request for proposal. Uh, do you use it uh, in, as an uh, augment to your specifications or actually do you use it to learn about new technologies uh, so ask you to go out for a request for proposal for folks to come back to your consulting firm and actually give you information about a new technology and, and explain to it. How, how do you get educated? How do you get so smart? We do research. You know, All our team does research. If it's new, we've, we've known about it and we probably vetted out almost every major player out there and some of the smaller ones. The, the startups especially like to get involved with a uh, when they see smart technology and consulting firm, they're knocking on the door, um, either emailing or reaching out on LinkedIn or something to get a connection to talk about it. And quite honestly, we look at all of it because quite, you, you know as well as I do, 
the smaller companies, the startups are very hungry, and a lot of them have spun off from major corporations and had a great idea that maybe didn't make the cut because when they did the analysis, they thought it wasn't going to be something that was going to work out well for bringing that uh, dollar into the organization. But it was a great idea. And now it gives them opportunity to share that with consulting firms. And we look it out, look at it, bet it out. Look at how it's networked. I mean, we we go through the same questions with everyone. That, you know, the cybersecurity part's very important. The software is the cloud hosted. What are the, you know, we look at how it communicates, what it can connect to, what's the API look like, what can you do with that API? How can I integrate it to other systems? So large or small, we we vet it out and we actually build an internal library and we have done things like with sensor technology and IEQ sensors where we've actually, we have a small OT lab, we call it our OT lab, where we actually um, have tested some things, we get some samples from these vendors and run it in our space side by side by other devices. And we know which ones perform the best, which ones cost the most, and maybe aren't the best value for the dollar, which ones just don't work at all. And then we try to integrate it in some of our systems, which I'm not gonna say any manufacturers, but everybody knows who the major, major players are out there right hey paul i want to bring us back to an, our, our initial um topic about the user experience right mm -hmm. because you mentioned a couple of things and i see a connection you know how do you deal with the tension between the fact you've described these are very bespoke systems that combine many different technologies mm -hmm. with the end goal but people would like a mobile app well there is no mobile app that embraces all of these systems you know mobile That's apps right. typically I can work with my IQ sensor. I can do this. How are you working with that tension? Are you seeing owners willing to pay for development of a mobile app for their bespoke problem situation needs? I've seen two things. Yes, they're willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Or they want to try to build it themselves, which doesn't always work real well. Because quite honestly, the leaders in the mobile app development right now are very experienced with all these different technologies within a facility. And they get involved with other types of things too, like stadiums, right? Where they're doing sports arenas. They're develop they've developed those apps. There's other different venues that they've developed apps. They've worked in higher education, healthcare. You know, they've been able to integrate with digital twins, pick up some of those different information into their, their system. We honestly they're it's about software development and good software developers always figure a way how to architect that solution and write that code that's required to bring that data in and share that data across an enterprise. And I think there are some key folks that are really great at it. There are some that can do some things. And then there are some that are just focused, very simple things, you know, lighting, HVAC, you know, maybe stream a little digital content across there, but nothing major. But it, it's all about the money. What's the budget, right? To develop it internally, we can do it cheaper? I don't think so. <laughs> okay, thanks. If I, I know could, there's other questions out there, go ahead. Yeah, let me let me try to, to add on to what you were saying, John. Um, I'm, I'm listening and it's all very interesting um, to, to hear your perspective on this whole thing. Mm -hmm. the, the thing that I'm trying to reconcile, you know, we've talked in this month's focus is on enablers, right? right. And um, there's been a lot of debate in the group about uh, what are the barriers. And part, one of the barriers that we talked about is user experience. Mm -hmm. And if I'm hearing right, what we're talking about, the barrier being here is that there is a lack of mobile integration. Mm -hmm. Is that is that kind of the gist of, of what you're saying? And, and we yes. did more of that, or is, yes. it, is there something more to it than just that? I mean, I'm way oversimplifying, I realize, but. No, I, I think the key is the mobile integration component, right? That That's the key, you know, the enablers are all those little components, right? That help simplify the end user's experience. Connecting that to a mobile device gives them access no matter where they're at. Um, if you see some folks trying to go through a tablet, that works as well too. But 
everybody's got a mobile device, right? You're either Apple or Android. There's not too many people that don't have. There's a few flip phones out there, but maybe Mark's got a flip phone. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> but um, the the reality is everything's driven off that mobile device now. And like I mentioned earlier, I connect to my house. My vehicle connects to my mobile device. I can access my music platforms. I can listen to music. I can get my traffic data. I can get my best route to get to work that day. I can book my meetings. I can see the cancellations if something changes. I can see traffic reports, reroute myself through GPS so I don't hit the traffic. There's a lot of things that happen and that connects from home to work and from work back to home. It's not just limited for work. And I think if you really look at what the key benefits of having that user experience like that, integrating it for the whole, it should be identified as a day in the life of the user, right? You don't just start at work. You start at home going to work. You, you go and route and do different things in the daytime. Integrating that all into a centralized platform makes it so, so much simpler. And if you're using mass transit, you bring that information as well. There's a lot of connectors out there. It's just people either have not asked or haven't done it. We do that research. We say, can we do these things? Yes. How do we do it? We work with that mobile developer to develop those uh, tool sets to be able to deliver that. Is, is your typical end user that you envision a facilities person? or No. In no. Tenant or employee. Quite honestly, the facility people are the last ones to use it. Well, Jim Lee here. Uh, who who's going to maintain these apps over the long run? It's once they're custom developed. If if they're custom developed, typically those app developers have, like everybody else, they have a service level agreement that's an annual basis um, thing. No different than any software platform or anything else, right? Um, some cases, if there's a large enough team, they may take over that support over the years after it's deployed and integrated and working. It could be hit, you know, handed over to a support team from operation side and IT side. We see that potentially occurring as well. Because a lot of times it's developing something is a lot different than supporting something, right? So. All right. Well, we're up on the hour and uh, Anto, because he had to leave, left me in charge to try to wrap it up. So Paul, it's been really interesting to have you come in and give us this other side of the perspective. Um, we had a minute for any, any final comments here uh, about what you're seeing and, and with, with owners and what they're trying to do for their occupants. So about one minute left. Any final words of wisdom for us? <laughs> final words of wisdom. Bring some young folks in that are going to be able to take over for all of us. <laughs> we can't find people that want to do this. I, really? I, I try to market that more than sometimes the business development. It's like, how do you, that's my concern with this whole thing, right? It's what's happening, where are the people coming from that are going to take over when we all retire? Mm -hmm. You know? Okay. Yeah, I mean, right. look, look at things now, you can, construction industry, everything. You know, you yep. can't find a contractor because they, they're booked out a year yeah. or so in advance, right? So. Mike Conway just had a great uh, comment in the in the chat about, you know, they're working on it with stacks and jewels to bring young people in. So, mm -hmm. all right, well, that's it, it for today on Monday Live. Paul, thank you again so much for uh, your comments, cool. spending time thanks, with us. Great, great discussion. Thanks everyone, great seeing you. Thanks, Paul. Right. Paul. Sure. Take care. We really appreciate your time. Uh, it was great. Thank you. Later. Bye. Bye Take now. Take care, everybody. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Bye now. <laughs> <laughs>